Neoliberalism was a really stupid idea. <laughs> I mean, all things considered, if you look at the basic principles behind it, of the ideas of shrinking government, of the ideas of all of us no longer working together but focusing on what wealth we can accumulate as individuals, the ideas of no taxation, the ideas of privatizing everything. These are all really stupid ideas. And what's particularly striking is that as stupid as these ideas are, somehow, over the course of the last 40 years, they've become the ideas that pretty much determine where we work, who we work for, how much we make, and what we get to spend our spare time, if we have any, doing. So the question that runs through my head is how a set of ideas that is that fundamentally flawed gains so much power over our lives over a period of just 40 years. This didn't happen by accident. And it didn't happen because people all over North America and around the world woke up and thought, hey, no, these are actually good ideas. It happened because these ideas had some power behind them. And these ideas had some privilege behind them. And that combination of power and privilege has been working for 40 years to make sure that these are the only ideas we hear about. So what's happened over the course of the last 40 years is that, you know, when people first heard these things 40 years ago, a lot of people actually thought, hey, these are pretty stupid ideas, right? Because 40 years ago, even conservative governments in North America believed in fair taxation. Even conservative governments in North America believed in the power of public pension plans, the power of public health care, the value of public services, the need for all of us to collectively pool our resources through taxation to pay for the things we value. So when these people started trotting out these ideas, when these academics, particularly out of the University of Chicago School of Economics, the Chicago boys, started trotting out these ideas, the reaction from everybody at the time, almost universally, was these are some pretty stupid ideas. They were unfathomable to people. So much so that in order to try these ideas out and put them into practice, they had to first go to countries where there were military dictatorships to impose these ideas because they knew that people in countries with democracies would never sign on to these ideas willingly. At the same time, however, a very small group of people with a lot of money and a lot of power decided that as far as they were concerned, maybe these were good ideas. Maybe getting rid of minimum wages, stopping taxation, getting rid of government regulations, getting rid of environmental regulations, privatizing everything might actually work for them because they would be able to make more money. They wouldn't have to contribute to public services. They wouldn't have to pay their workers decent wages. And they thought, hey, this could work for us. And what they started doing is dumping obscene amounts of money into the birth and creation of think tanks across North America that were able to start writing about these ideas. And then they talked to their friends in the media and said to their friends in the media, hey, you guys are part of this 1% group of us that makes all this money. Why don't you guys start making space for these ideas and repeating them over and over and over again? And the way you take an idea from a position of being 
absurd and ridiculous and unfathomable into a place where people think, hey, that might be something we could try, is by repeating it ad infinitum and not making space for any other ideas. And if that's all you hear for 40 years, that this is what we need to do, this is the way forward, this is the way society should function, then all of a sudden you start to believe it. And those ideas start to make some sense to you. And that's where we've gotten to today, is that after 40 years of this, there's a large chunk of the population that actually believes these things. The bigger challenge we face today is that we've heard these things so often that people don't even consider them ideas anymore. They consider them truths. So that there are parts of Alberta where you'd have as much luck convincing somebody that our taxes are too low as you would convincing them that 2 plus 2 equals 7. Because these ideas for a lot of people have become as unquestionable as gravity. And the economists continue to push these ideas forward. Most economists, sorry, I mean, sorry. <laughs> Most economists continue to push these ideas forward, and they continue to push them forward as a science. So this is where we are today. We're in a battle of ideas. We need to start by, as Hassan said this morning, helping people in face-to-face -face conversations take these things back out of this realm of truth so that they recognize once again that these are just ideas. Then we have to do the work of showing them that these are actually stupid ideas. And that's where we at the Parkland Institute come in. The analogy would be if what we're engaged in is a battle of ideas, we want to be your arm supplier for that battle of ideas. Now, part of that reality is that in order for us to be your arm supplier, right, arms are expensive. So you heard Gil talk this morning about how the Manning Center raises $30 million a year to constantly put these ideas in our faces how the Fraser Institute raises $40 million a year to constantly put these ideas in our faces. And these are organizations that have privileged access to our means of communication, to our media, to our television stations, to our radio stations. They're using that much money to put these ideas in our faces. We at the Parkland Institute don't have anywhere near that much money. But our goal is to work with you guys to put a different set of ideas in people's faces. To put the ideas that come from that place where we all believe that working together, we can help take care of each other. That collective work, that solidarity, trumps individual pursuit of blind profit. Where we believe that things like healthcare, education, post-secondary education, social services, things that are in the public good that we all benefit from should not only be paid for by all of us, but also be accountable to all of us, not to some shareholder's bottom line. <laughs> so that's why we're here at the AFL convention. That's why we work closely with labor in this province. Because the things that Gil was talking about this morning that labor makes as their priorities, this recapturing of our values, are the things that we're working towards, the things that we want to do. These are the ideas that we want to get out there. We're working for it on energy policy. We're working for it on taxation policy. We're working for it on healthcare policy, on education policy. We are doing the research. We're doing it in conjunction with you, and we hope that, like Hassan said, you're going to get on the doorsteps and put these ideas on in the hands of your members and your coworkers and your colleagues. We need your help to do that. We need your financial support to do that. 
and we need your legwork to do that.